Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Tokyo FinTech Podcast. It's a pleasure today to be here with Lex Sokolin, who's the co-head of FinTech at Consensus. Hello, Lex. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. You also have a very illustrious previous career as a founder. So you founded NestEck, which was acquired by Advisor Engine. Advisor Engine got acquired by Franklin Templeton. Then you went on into, or maybe back to research, founded Autonomous Next as part of Autonomous Research, which got acquired by Alliance Bernstein. So successful exits on your resume there. Thanks for the positive highlight. You could also call it a series of fortunate or unfortunate mistakes. All entrepreneurship is, I think in large part, luck is just you have to be at the table. And sometimes I wonder whether the things that I do work because of what I'm trying to do or despite of what I'm trying to do. You know, you, you never quite know whether it's the sector, it's the team, it's the market, it's what you're doing. But I think as long as you have a point of view and you execute on that point of view, you're going to find sometimes product market fit and many times at least conceptual alignment with people who agree with your vision and go along on the journey. One success might be accidental, but if you have multiple of them in a row, then the probability that it has something to do with skill is much higher. Right? I'll uh, take the compliment. But also, in, in terms of timing, Nasdaq was closer to the last financial crisis. And so coming out of that deep valley of despair, many people obviously say that you should found a startup in the middle of the crisis. If you look at where we are now, of course, there's this wall of cash coming as, as well as all the money that has been printed. But there's such an abundance of capital that almost everything gets funded. And how do you compare the environment for startup founders from the time you started Nasdaq versus what we have today? I think that's a fantastic question. I'll answer it a couple of ways. I think as a person, as an entrepreneur, I guess I self-conceptualize in many ways as like an artist or an architect because I grew up make, doing a lot of visual art. That ended up taking me into building websites and then through the American recruiting system and for a whole bunch of reasons, I went into finance and economics, but I still think very much about the new open page and figuring out what do you do with the page? How do you create the language in which you're going to render the thing that you make? What is the thing that you're going to make? You know, And kind of, I have this excitement for the frontier, which is not always reasonable, but but I, I strictly prefer the new because I think it's interesting and it's compelling to me. And so that's definitely my bias. And so today in 2020, when I look around and I see fintech and it's been, you know, 500 billion in venture capital and, and financial is going to IPO at 200 billion and Facebook is launching lending in India and Brazil, that to me feels no longer like the edge or the frontier and very much you know, I look for what are the crazy people doing? What are the people on the outskirts that are being disrespected? What is it that they're doing? And to me, at least, there's a pretty obvious answer, which is decentralized finance. But if I look at 2008 and, you know, when I ended up getting pulled into entrepreneurship, it was a very different environment and not just because of a less synthetic economy, but it was a different environment because of a couple of cultural attributes. Number one, the word fintech didn't exist. There was lots of financial technology, but it was seen as your IT infrastructure that sits in New Jersey, whereas the salespeople and the bankers live in New York, make 20 times more than the technology people. Google and Facebook broke all that entirely. I mean, if you look at the top three companies by market cap today are each worth about one and a half trillion, and each one of them is a high-tech artificial intelligence monstrosity, whereas JP Morgan is less than a third the worth of any of these things. So that was not there yet. And the word fintech didn't come around until about 2012, where VCs started organizing this investment theme. And so there's a big market shift in terms of both more private investment, more venture capital, generally speaking, relative to public equities. And then second, much more allocation to financial services within private investment. So whereas in 2010, 2009, it might have been 5% of all VC that went to finance, you know, today it's somewhere between 16 and 20%, which is the same as the public markets. And so when I was starting the company, I guess the, the final cultural attribute to point out is Goldman Sachs at the time would have been embarrassed to be associated with Goldman Sachs of today. Retail customers are yucky. You don't want to be a bank. You don't want to have small accounts. These are bad clients. You want to fire them. You only want to work with the ultra high net worth, 25 million and up in assets. This is garbage business, trash. We don't want it. And if you spoke with any of the large investment banks, you know, I started my career in 06 at Lehman. 
So that was my first exit, actually. But if you spoke with any of the banks, they were doing these exercises, purging the small accounts and purging retail and building up walled gardens. And so Goldman Sachs would have been a completely different creature and unthinkable that today as part of the sort of like cultural approach, Goldman wants to be a tech company and be lending club and Bitcoin and all of it at the same time. You know, there's a lot of discomfort for me as a fairly young entrepreneur to go out and do what is today entirely obvious, which is just take wealth management, put it on a website. There was a lot of discomfort because to be first is uncomfortable, but also to be constantly being told, no, this is a bad idea by people who are well capitalized and, you know, have a track record that you respect, that does kind of build up a level of scar tissue. And I think Today, I've gotten to a level of scar tissue, which makes me fairly inured to reasonable argument, uh, you know, which is a nice place to be. I mean, in a way, Goldman has the benefit of being a greenfield. I mean, it's no different than any other startup. If you look at what they're doing with Marcus, what they're doing on the transaction banking side as well, if you actually can build from scratch and you've got the capital to hire good people from the outside and very senior people from Amazon, etc., then you have the benefit of really not having legacy assets, which is a big difference to anybody else who's trying to do the same? First off, of the public banks, I think Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, BBVA and Santander, probably DBS in Singapore, the Nordic banks, those are the names that after three years of deep dive equity research come up over and over again as actually trying to reform and do something new. It's really hard to do that with an established institution and respect to them for going in that direction. You know, Schwab and BlackRock are the other names that come up on the asset management side. So what they're doing is hard. Goldman is, in addition, you know, as you're saying, it has a green field in the sense that it was always an investment bank. It was not a universal bank like a Wells Fargo or a Citi. Uh, it's much harder for Citi to do this than it is for Goldman. And so they do have these greenfield opportunities in that they haven't done consumer. They haven't done all this underwriting. They, the balance sheet's new. So like, that's true. On the other hand, all of these guys, all they're doing is copying eight-year-old ideas. There's nothing new. There's no work that is being done sort of conceptually, which stands apart from what tiny little teams starving all over the world, starving in sort of a rhetorical sense, starving to win, wanting to earn a big company outcome, have come up a lot earlier before, right? So Marcus's lending club, it's not new. The robo-advisor stuff, Goldman's taken a couple of swings at, one through acquisition of the Dell company, one through 401k acquisition. Again, robo-advisors are 2007, 2008, sort of very first one. The one that I started working on was 2009, 2010. Wealthfront was 2012. So again, Goldman's not Betterment, but even though they might be the bigger Betterment down the line, similarly, if you kind of go step by step, right, like they're not Starling for their participation in Circle and their sort of mixed work around blockchain. Again, they are kind of a reflection of the theme. And so I think to some extent, that's the Wall Street playbook. It's been very hard for banks to create an innovation ecosystem the way that the tech companies have. It exists. The fintech innovation ecosystem exists, and it is outsourced R&D for the banks. But it's harder for the banks to be generous acquirers, which is really what you need. If you want to have a multi-level pyramid scheme with a lottery at the top to incentivize lots and lots of innovation, where the lottery at the top is WhatsApp gets bought for a billion bucks with 20 people, you've got to have a track record of banks spending the money to acquire teams, even when the teams don't yet have all the answers. And this is really hard from a bank management perspective, both because of the cultural issue, but also because of how banks are assessed by public investors. They're just not given the leeway to make sort of silly acquisitions repeatedly. And this is what you need to have the wild ideas really come to fruition. You know, I admire Goldman, but at the same time, I really do wish it was easier for fintechs to have that flow into the exits and then back into the economy. Coming back to this innovation question, how much of what we're seeing now is actually new or are there so many copycats in the fintech space that still get financed? Part of the answer you've given already, the edge out there for you is DeFi. But if you look at the last two or three years in how the overall fintech ecosystem has evolved with all the buzzwords around it, have we really seen anything new in the core fintech space versus what's now coming with DeFi? 
There are a number of ways to drive at that question. And on the whole, I think we have equilibriated to the GDP level of financial services in an economy in terms of venture investment. You know, so we're not over-indexed fintech. We're at about the right amount, which is 20-25%. That's, you look at GDP, that's financial services. So I'm not worried about that. I mean, SoftBank makes a lot of mistakes, and they make mistakes with equal weight in financial services as they do in other industries. Then when you start kind of getting into the meat of the industry, end of the day, all of these are human teams, and they have human goals and different people are building things for different reasons. I think we often slice the industry in a way that doesn't, it doesn't align with behavioral basics. It aligns with sort of schematics of the industry, you know, so to say this is an enterprise team, it's a B2B team, like, I think that doesn't really fit my mental model as much. Whereas, you know, I really think that on the consumer side, on the client side, well, let's start even kind of one step back, which is you can take any economic activity in financial services and you can say very roughly that there is activity which is manufacturing. So you're making a thing, right? You're like whittling a chair or you're making a website or you're cooking a dish or you're making a car. And in our case, you are making a financial product. And that requires either the underwriting of putting the capital at risk to lend or to insure that might require for you to pick stocks or to pick or construct asset allocations in investment management and asset management. On the payment side, that might require for you to take the fraud risk of payment rail and running the pay- operating and running the payment rail. Or in the banking side, it might require for you to actually be the licensed depository institution and so on. So you're, you're making a financial product. If you're a hedge fund, you're just a factory, just a factory of returns. And then at the very opposite side of it is a client. And the client is, end of the day, always just a person. You can have a long value chain away from the client, but there's there's always a person on the other side. So everything's B2C. Even your pension business is B2C because your client is your, your human being that receives the pension through a value chain that involves the employer and so on. The front of the house is distribution. It's the branch. It's the storefront. It's the mobile phone. It's the customer service in a call center. So there's a distribution aspect. And there's been a lot of work on distribution in fintech over the last 10 years. Shoving a human experience into a phone experience is a distribution play. And then there's the thing in the middle, which is the value chain. And it's some combination of middle office, trading and rebalancing, collateral management, CRM, all the stuff that's in between, supply chain financing, all all the things that in in our industry claims assessment and insurance that make the glue between the manufacturing and the distribution. What fintech has primarily done is focused on trying to tell a story about attention platforms, which is what the tech companies had won on, right? So Facebook had won on capturing the social graph and all the people that are interacting there. Google had won on capturing the entire knowledge set of the human species, at least the English speaking human species. Amazon had done the same for commerce and the attention that flows around that. They they had won the store. And taking that analogy to financial services, do things in a simple way. You see and you transpose. And so transposing sort of very bluntly the attention game to financial services is what Revolut and Robinhood and and SoFi and the rest of sort of quote unquote scaled fintechs, unicorn fintechs are at today, primarily distribution. That's useful and important, and it collapses price, which is great for the consumer because you have more supply, creates access, erodes barriers. So I'm a big fan of that. But I think, end of the day, when you look at that solution set, I think we've roughly hit what that solution set is. And it's because people don't do that much stuff with finance. They pay, they save, they borrow, they invest, they lend, they insure. That's basically it. There's like the six things. This is why all the apps are converging of the, on those six things. And this is why Citigroup had always had the six things. And that's why Universal Bank's a universal bank. 200 years ago, they were the, sec- the same six things. And 200 years from now, they'll be the same six things. And when you look at DeFi, it's again the same six things, right? So I think there's a limited bandwidth for ideation around what finance is. Now, the other theme is sort of the middle office and B2B and enterprise, and you can reframe this in a bunch of ways. A whole set of AI companies live in there, but the core pitch is just do the thing you do 20% cheaper or do the thing you do 80% faster. This is your value chain, but now it's compressed, right? Or it's much easier to do, or it's digital, or it's account opening, or 
there's lots and lots of horror stories we can talk about that compose financial infrastructure. And so I think that's interesting and useful, but end of the day, it's non-transformational. It's incremental. It doesn't even change the value chain. It merely makes the value chain more efficient. For example, the transition from, this reveals my bias, so the transition from hosted infrastructure, managed infrastructure by a large bank to the cloud, which benefits Google and IBM and the rest of the, Microsoft and the rest of the cloud companies with dozens of billions of dollars in revenue, right? Like the tech companies get an order of magnitude stronger because they're hosting financial data. That entire shift, even though it's you could say meaningful and important, to me is entirely uninteresting because nothing's going on. You've changed where you run your software, but it's the, you're running it on the same thing it's, and it's the same software and there's no architectural difference. And so that's kind of the layer, what I described as the middle office, even though that's a simplification. And then underneath that is the manufacturing. And I think what I've come to believe is that without change in the manufacturing process, all the other stuff is really just fluff. And I'm being rhetorical here. I don't really mean that because I do think there's been a lot of impact, but it is non-existential. So in the way that the digital manufacturing of media entirely destroyed the publishing process of books and newspapers, the way that the digital manufacturing of like a unit of film that you would consume as a consumer that you would buy and not needing a tape entirely destroyed the physical distributors of film like Blockbuster. The way that the digital manufacturing of like the shopping experience, how do you shop? Where do you go? That Amazon has created this good, which is your, your consumption of a shopping experience has completely destroyed the malls and the you know, physical shopping. And obviously this is amped up a thousand percent in the East. Finance has not had that manufacturing digitally transformation. And there's lots of reasons for why. Regulation, barriers to entry, like massive capital barriers to entry, incentives at the corporate level for highly paid executives to protect a cash flow business. There's lots and lots of reasons for why it has not happened. But I think that is sort of the heart of the beast. So then it goes to are you the kind of person that wants to groom the beast or are you the kind of person that wants to have new beasts all over and what you find interesting? And, you know, for me, it's a really interesting experiment to see what if we just have an entirely different infrastructure, an entirely different way of manufacturing savings and lending and investments and so on, which needs none of the legacy infrastructure at all with a zero dollar marginal cost. What does that look like? And I think that's the really interesting thing and, and why I'm kind of so obsessed with DeFi. Right. And so coming back to the six things, how complicated can it be? And still even finance or even fintech to a large extent seems to make it much more complicated than it should be. I mean, especially in Japan, I've seen robber advisors that invest into ETFs, which have a low fee structure, but then the robber advisor charges you 1% on top. That doesn't make any sense to me. The market price in the US today Vanguard has entered the space after a decade. So Vanguard is a decade late. They have the benefit of like $3 trillion in assets and their price is 15 basis points for everything, which means by corollary that the value of financial asset allocation is zero. That's where we are. Complexity grows out at the edges and there's good reasons for it. So even something, you know, we can take a completely simple example this is complexity theory, right? It's like, I think Stephen Wolfram recently released a bunch of writing that in his uh, semi-retirement, he's shifted from commercializing Mathematica and going back to his physics roots. And he believes that simple transformation rules take A, B and turn it into B, A as the transformation of a set. If you were to create these rules and have them interact, they could essentially spawn through their complexity, the entire universe and all the dimensions. You know, so uh, like a simple transformation rule at the core of what is our reality or our simulation can derive all the laws of physics, all the properties of from quantum mechanics to relativity to like the, the whole thing. And for him, this is his obsession. It's a highly compelling and sort of like addictive concept that from mere arithmetic, you get cathedrals. And so we can say, all you've got to do is just buy a portfolio, but then let's go into the place of, okay, well, do you have one account? You have one account for your savings and then one account for your quick cash that you need to spend and then maybe one account for retirement. Okay, well, what if you now are married? Do you want a joint account 
yeah, sure, let's have a joint account. So then you want an account where you take some portion and you asset allocate that to something together. Do you want the three accounts as well for the different time horizons? Yeah, okay, yeah, I want that. And then, okay, well, how do you want to do performance reporting on that? Like, do you want to see the whole household or do you want to just see your accounts? I want to see the whole household. Okay, well, when did you move the money in and who did that money movement? And so all of all your performance benchmarks start breaking. And then now you've got, let's say you're in your 50s and you've got two kids and then the kids are still logging into the same robo-advisor. Do they see the whole household assets or do they just see the permission part to an account that you gave them that they think they hold, but they don't, and they want to customize it. And all of a sudden you get to the place of Goldman Sachs serving ultra high net worth clients where every performance report is 55 pages and super customized and really difficult. At Advisor Engine back in the day, you know, I was building out this household performance reporting functionality and the ability to group and create permissions and the ability to share different client portals based on the complexity of each household situation. And so what would be theoretically a really simple problem to say, well, you give the right people the right permissions becomes just like this horrible set of complexity. And now you multiply it by a million fold by creating interactions with the different asset classes, which is why I think the answer is standardized infrastructure or standards around what a money is and where it travels and how it's packaged and what a savings account and so on. When we look at today's fintech software in in sort of like the middle office space, it is just a mishmash. And not only is it a mishmash, but it does nothing other than manipulate abstractions. And what I mean by that is if you've got like a rebalancing software, all it does is it takes in some text data called a QCIP or a ticker with some numerical values associated with those text values. It does a bunch of mathematical transformations for what the portfolios would be. And then it spits out again, a set of these QCIPs with entities next to them. And then it passes it off to like another software, like an order routing software or order management software, which again, takes a bunch of abstracted text fields and then shoves it downstream to yet another software and so on and on and on until it hits some CSD, which then does some sort of reconciliation. And every one of these connectors along the way has breaks, you know, so 5% mistakes every single morning. And some poor person is waking up to look at the breaks to, to fix them because this system thinks options should be valued like this. And this system thinks options should be valued like this. And they forgot to subtract the dividends. It ends up being such nonsense because these are all just models of models. They don't apply to anything real. And again, bringing it back to my, you know, my pet subject is having natively digital finance where there's no question about what the asset is. You can, you can poke it. It's right there. You can see it and it's only yours. And there's no software that can act on an asset other than a software that actually acts on the asset. I mean, imagine you're, you know, you're in the real world and you're trying to buy apples. And instead of just picking up the apple, you have a conversation with 20 people about how you're going to pick up the apple. And, and that's what financial technology does today. So I'm really excited about this attempt at transforming things. Okay, now you mentioned standards on the one side to definition of what money is. And then many people are focused on tokenizing any asset whatever it might be, from cows in Myanmar to Kentucky bourbon whiskey, etc. How can you combine both? Or what's your perspective? Will we have both? Will we have some standardization on the true essentials of what money is and then everything else works its way through the market and some will be accepted and some will not be? So I, I think these are very much the same thing, at least in the way that I'm framing them in, in the sense that a blockchain, so I'm conflicted. You know, my, my company consensus is rooted in the Ethereum founding experience came out of that and is very much commercializing software that's built on Ethereum, which is an open source programmable blockchain. I think Bitcoin is a fantastic project, clearly valuable, um, but I don't hold a strong view about what should ride the Bitcoin rails. I think Bitcoin should ride the Bitcoin rails and people should hold it as an alternative asset. And you know that's sort of the end of the story. It does not appear to be a replacement for large scale payment network. Well, it, it is a replacement for a large scale payment network, but it doesn't seem to be on the cusp of dethroning Visa today. Separate and apart from that, Ethereum is a programmable blockchain, meaning that you can run software on it that the whole network executes. And software means you can build anything on it. As you said, from cow tracking to video games, to supply chain, to digital assets. 
digital securities, let's say. The thing that the blockchain does is essentially it enforces property rights around these digital assets through its code execution. So if you've got a digital asset, then I don't have it. And because it's generalizable, it's not Bitcoin, it's literally anything that you would decide to program, it can be broadly expanded to the financial services system to replace is the wrong word, but to uh, mirror and compete with the functions of the existing system. You know, I think there is a path to getting there over time. And the way that happens is first, you have to lay the groundwork around data sharing and data standards and common workflows. And so this is very uncontroversial. Just say, like, let's replace our data store with public or private chain. You know, we've done this for a supply chain consortium called Comgo. We're doing this for Covantis, which is another one, a few others. And in this case, it's really just putting data and agreeing on the same format and the same information being a source of truth. Another project that's relevant is called Baseline, where you're taking ERP systems and you're anchoring data generated by these ERP systems to a chain. The data itself is not readable, but the fact that it's there is. And so you can have you know, gigantic corporations having a source of truth without having to integrate their systems. But that's really not the full benefit of the blockchain. That's a, This is the argument you make. Why not just have a Google spreadsheet? And so the next step up is the digital asset. So the tokenization of some particular asset, whether that is a natively tokenized asset like uh, Ether or whether it's some utility token that you use as a coin to open up a functionality of a vending machine on the network or whether it is a security or a collectible or, or you know, an art piece, a deed, a certification, you can start to tokenize things and put them as objects into the machine. And so this is what makes it really interesting and kind of what I was alluding to, where instead of having lots of abstractions that things interact with, that software interacts with, you actually have the actual asset is there to be moved and punted around in the system because there's only one actual real digital asset. And then once you have the digital asset, and I think this is kind of where we are as an industry, you want to do something with it. You want to trade it. You want to move it. You want to collateralize it and, or lend it. You want to sell it. And so you need to incrementally build the software that exists in our existing infrastructure into the network. You need portfolio management systems. You need underwriting systems. You need anti-fraud systems and KYC and AML systems. All the stuff that makes the financial industry tick but it's in a different language and it lives in a different place in the same way that we had to rebuild everything when we moved from on-premise to the cloud. You have a different architecture. And so these enabling technologies of what you do with the assets start to slowly be built into the programmable blockchain network itself. But the nice thing about it is software that is open source and shared with everybody. And so you remove and mutualize the value out of these softwares. You don't need a thousand CRMs or a thousand underwriting systems or a thousand claims assessment systems that compete with each other. You can have a default that everybody uses and maybe additional ones that people buy on top. And so as the software gets written into the chain and people start to use it in scale, you also have this interlocking effect where there is no difference between a real estate investment and an insurance contract and a stock and payment or a unit of cash equivalent or money or even a synthetic Bitcoin asset or some digital video game asset. All of these are tokens that travel on a blockchain. And so to that end, you can have exchange between asset classes that never had interoperability before. And there's lots of barriers to this, right? Like people are used to the mountain of paperwork. People are used to closing private equity in a way that's very different from a corporate bond transaction. But we have to ask whether that difference is there for a good reason or for a bad reason. And what um, Ethereum allows us to unpack is, again, a single rail for nearly every type of asset class in financial services. And I think this is the path, right? And for large companies, most of enterprises are still in this sort of like data sharing, tokenization world. They're putting their toes into the public chain, but for good reason are, are slow to do it. And then there are a number of digital asset companies who've been tokenizing real estate and trying to find a market, but are disconnected both from the underlying market on the bottom and disconnected from the fully permissionless and sort of like the crazier, more risk-seeking stuff at the top. And then you've got the sort of the very edge of the extreme, which is decentralized finance, where people have written all the software already, where there's tons of interoperable, composable, multi-asset class infrastructure 
but where the assets that are traveling through that infrastructure are almost entirely speculative. The thing that's in the machine at that high end today is very much an experiment and is driven in large part by people seeking very abnormal alpha returns. And so we have this really dynamic environment. For me, my interest is how does this all come together? How do you bring it together? Because the promise of propagating that extreme through the rest of the industry is really interesting. And on that journey, how are you thinking about regulation that you will run into at some point, which also, as you said before, protects the incumbents and creates a barrier to entry, while the technology can allow you to do things much more efficiently and do it in a borderless way. We're still constrained by the concept of nation states and the regulation within for the most part. It's a really impossible question for any one particular agent or one particular actor in the ecosystem. You know, I, th I think you figure out who you work for, whether it's for yourself as an entrepreneur trying to get an exit or whether it's for a 50-person team that's trying to get acquired or whether it's for a 10,000-person bank that's trying to cut costs. And you adjust your strategy and, and the strategies will play out and kind of bump against each other and, and shake out on the other side. It's very hard to influence the broader dynamic there are attributes of the broader dynamic that are important, which is you can form relationships with your regulator and you can lobby them, you can educate them, you can share information. The FCA in London, for example, is very, very open to the tech community and having a conversation and is constantly engaged in the thinking. I think in a lot of Europe, certainly it's, it's responsive thinking, but there's very active engagement with, you know, what are stable coins, or how should they travel, what does a CBDC look like, and so on. I think in places like the US where it's like a Kafkaesque nightmare because one regulator says yes and the other regulator says no and the third regulator is quiet until they put you in jail. You know, so money transmitters, banking, commodities, investments. You can just be a good actor and be transparent, right? That's, that's all you can control. I think in the US, like just to give an example, the OCC came out and said that any bank can now custody crypto keys. For three years before, it is this concept of I'm painting with a broad brush, but like these are horrible assets. Nobody wants to hold them, tax evasion, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next step is, oh, actually, every single bank can now hold this. It's like, well, if banks can't bank crypto companies, and now we're in a place where all the banks can custody crypto assets. It's a psychotic outcome. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's a great step, but it's, it's the, you know, the, the evidence of a completely schizophrenic environment. So I don't think you can really... All you can do is protect yourself from obvious regulatory missteps. And people know when they're, when they're breaking the law. They really do. If you go out and raise one and a half billion with a placard in Times Square and then put into your legal documents that you're not raising money from American investors, you know that you are not doing the right thing. I mean, there, there's, I think that the number of people who are naive about regulation and make an honest mistake is much narrower and so thin relative to either people who are choosing to be bad actors or people who are choosing to be good actors, but doing so relying on something that's still not defined. The other part of the context is, of course, the global competition. So nothing moves the space like fear and the Chinese development, both of their non-blockchain digital currency, but also of the national blockchain services network, which is meant to incorporate and surveil, you know, and financial intensive, but also all the other chains extended through the belt region, therefore into Africa and the Middle East and in Asia. That's a large geopolitical economic threat to the US, which then has to match. And I think China is matching in some sense Bitcoin and Facebook. Like it didn't come out of nowhere, right? So without Bitcoin, you wouldn't have the blockchain services network. And I think Bitcoin alone wouldn't have done it. And you needed the perceived threat of a Facebook global currency now fairly declawed in order for Europe and for the US to take much more seriously this concept of CBDCs. And now the fact that the central banks are all churning out CBDC research and pilots is creating the next feed feedback loop, which is entrepreneurs and companies trying to get ready for something around that. You know, whether it's PayPal, I don't think PayPal would have gone into you know, wanting to power crypto if we weren't on this narrative of central bank digital currencies from China and a lot of the rest of the world. And so this feedback cycle, I think, is just the productive start and stop of how we move forward. But again, going to the root of it, as an individual actor who might be working on a very local project, be able to demonstrate good faith and best efforts. And that's really as far as you can go.
if you do the comparison and the Chinese currency or at least the test network is out there, it feels like the US and Europe are two or three years behind. Or maybe it's less because it's largely also using what is available in terms of public protocols these days. But the Chinese have been laser focused on a number of industries and blockchain and digital currency is certainly one of them. I do think it's pretty embarrassing for the U.S. to miss the national priority, which is AI and blockchain. The competitive position in those two technologies have the potential to be such a platform shift, and it's disappointing that there's not a coherent ability to tackle those. I think there's the reason for that failure is multifold and points to just the general discord in the U.S. right now. And if you look at Europe, with the U.K. being, you know, U.K. is like 50% of fintech investment in Europe, but it's completely mired in Brexit and coronavirus. And so this key moment, I think these countries are sidelined and, you know, are not able to put forward a credible national policy, even though that's really important. At the same time, you could definitely make the argument that the private sector alternatives are going to be more competitive. Maybe, maybe not. You know, but the example of Elon Musk sending SpaceX to fuel the International Space Station at a cost that's literally 90% less than the space shuttle or what the Russian rockets or the Chinese rockets can do. I think that's quite telling that, yes, you can definitely have a private industry answer, which is the capital markets generate better things than central planning. I think you can have a debate whether the capital markets are better at optimizing or whether they're better at infrastructure laying. I don't have a developed view on on that. So then you go and say, okay, well, what are the capital markets doing? What are they giving us? And what they're giving us is Facebook, Apple, and Google, and Amazon in the West. And the question is, those four entities together are worth $4 trillion or $5 trillion. And so Are those entities going to lay the blockchain infrastructure for the entire economy across the U.S. and its zone of political influence? And the answer feels very much like no, whether it is because of other competing priorities. You know, so Apple, I think, is betting very large on augmented reality and glasses and AI hardware. You know, I think for Amazon and for Google and Microsoft, it's the cloud play of big data and AI again. Facebook is trying, if I were to boil it down, I think Facebook is trying to catch up with Ant Financial. I think that's what, Mm -hmm. with Alibaba and Ant. Libra as a stable coin rail and what they're doing in India and Brazil with WhatsApp and payments and what they're doing with their competitive Instagram and Facebook shopping apps very much to me feels like, can we copy Alibaba and Ant? And so nowhere there do I see, let's push hard on forcing the whole economy to shift to blockchain, even if there's cost to it in the short term. As a person in the West, I mean, I definitely have concern that we're missing the boat on this stuff in a big way. And I think the counter argument and where I I get comfortable is that Linux is by far the dominant operating system across the entire world. Elon Musk's rockets, when they went to the International Space Station, were running Linux. You know, not Windows, not iOS, not anything else, Linux. Every Android phone in the world is running Linux. And so if Ethereum is Linux, it's that open source operating system for property rights and economic exchange. That's really powerful, and it's almost impossible to supplant. You know, so that open source advantage, if you give it 20 years to run, you know, is permanent. That is what I hope happens, even though, you know, on the national scale, the dynamics are quite toxic at the moment. Totally agree. Maybe for a few minutes, turn it around and you can ask or share your perception of Asia and and Japan or or validate it against my view. I try to have a mental model of the different chess players in the industry. And so those players are the financial services incumbents. They are the fintech startups that are trying to build, at the end of the day, a financial services incumbent. They are the Western high-tech companies, which in large part are precluded from financial services in the U.S., but are trying to play with this in other parts of the world. They are the Eastern tech companies. People use the word 
tech fin, I guess, where the financial services is, is at the core and then technology is the tentacles. And then finally, it's kind of the crypto ecosystem, which is global and scrappy and sometimes feels like a collection of misfits, although that's very much changing. And so that's my mental model. And, you know, I kind of walk you through the concept around regulation and the international in the international competition. First off, there's definitely a distance in the West from just how powerful Chinese wealth and impact is in Asia. You know, so if you look at India or Malaysia or Indonesia or Vietnam or, or Korea, what it means to be Chinese is very different than what it means to be Chinese in the West. And so I think that's a really interesting dynamic. And I wonder whether there's a different perception of Chinese technology in Asia than there is in the West, where in the West, it's like, is this copycat technology? Is this technology for the long tail of the unbanked where there was nothing there before? And so like building a, a payment app with very simple functionality is a problem that the West doesn't have. You know, th these are stereotypes that people have. But to me, it, what's hard to capture is the flip side is just how in Asia and in the region, it's, it's uh, a much more dominant force. And I don't know if there's like a bigger prestige associated with Ant and Tencent and what that interaction looks like. And in a similar vein, what is the relationship of the Japanese tech giants? You know, we I know that SoftBank owns everything, but I don't see SoftBank rolling out. You know, they, they've invested in Ant Financial, but there's not a Japanese version of the same. So it's funny how it has changed in a way, right? Certainly China has copied before, but now with all this super apps and so on, it seems like what you said, Facebook trying to be like a WeChat. Now the move of ideas is coming a bit from the East to the West now. Technical complexity of what we're competing on is almost beyond comprehension. I mean, to say that we need to spend 50 billion on artificial intelligence because it's a national priority, it's like a nonsense statement. It's a religious statement. It doesn't mean anything. But then when you look at point examples of what the technology can accomplish, and then you look at what's necessary for that technology to accomplish those examples, I mean, it is really beyond the lay understanding of the average person, right? So whereas you could say we want to, our Cold War technology race is about sending a rocket to the moon or into space so that there are satellites watching what everybody does. And if we want to send a nuke to a specific place, we can do it because we have supremacy. Like There's like an intuition to that logic. Whereas... For AI and blockchain, these are such abstract concepts that for the regular person to understand either what it means or what the implications are, almost impossible. So for example, I wrote about it this week. OpenAI, which got started by Musk and a few others as a nonprofit, funded a billion bucks, then became for-profit and got another billion from Microsoft. So now just a, a regular sort of foot soldier in the race released a paper for a natural language processing generator, which was trained on eight years of internet crawled data. So they spent eight years crawling the web in order to create a data set. And then they have 175 billion parameters in order to generate language. And, and the language that can be generated is everything from Harry Potter fan fiction to writing software code. And I think that's just such a, both a powerful technology, but a difficult to understand technology that, you know, I worry it's not really going to catch on in the public imagination. And it's going to be a much more difficult political act in order to really compete on this at the national level. Super. Thank you very much, Lex, for the great conversation. This was also our anniversary edition. So this will be the 50th episode of the Tokyo Fintech Podcast. So we timed it well. Thanks very much for your insight and best of luck uh, continuing the journey with consensus. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. For folks that want to um, engage a little bit more with the writing, check out fintechblueprint.com. And I'm on Twitter at Lex Sokolin. And then for consensus, it's just consensus.net. So look forward to uh, continuing the conversation with everybody. And thanks for having me.